So you can see, uh, I don't know if you can see that well, but I'll give you some explanation. First of all, Dennis is all over here. And I thought it this would be a, a nice way to uh, uh, show you Israel a little bit. Uh, Dennis came uh, twice. Okay, there's Mark over there as well. Uh, you can see, uh, you probably recognize the upper left corner, the lower right corner. This is, uh, these are views of Jerusalem. Uh, over here, there's Dennis. I'm describing because I don't know if you think this very well. Dennis sitting on a rock here just on the Sea of Galilee, the Kinneret. We call it the Kinneret. You can see the Golan Heights in the background. And he has a good uh, gold-style beer, which has, it's an Israeli beer, has a good reputation. Uh, in the upper right corner, Dennis is up in the uh, Galil, where I live, the, uh, the uh, northwestern part of, of the country. Uh, so we had fun. We had a lot of fun. And uh, so I hope he's uh, watching and, and smiling, seeing all of what's happening here. Okay, so let's get into the, uh, get into the practice-based evidence idea. First of all, a few words about Maccabi. Maccabi is a public uh, health plan in Israel, one of four public health plans. Uh, it was founded in 1941. Uh, there were very few doctors. The, the, the saying is that uh, they were all volunteers. They didn't have any salary, uh, very few members. Uh, by now, we have about 2 million uh, citizens registered in the health plan, which is about a quarter of Israel's population. Uh, 150 community-based uh, branches, uh, health branches, and we have within the system 82 in-house physical therapy clinics. They're all using photo, and I'll talk about the implementation that we went through. Uh, we also, we're contracted with, uh, with several private clinics. Uh, implementation uh, of photo has not really started there. It's... Uh, uh, we haven't invested in that, and since we haven't invested in that, it, it really, nothing really happened there. So they're not really using photo yet, but they will. About 500 therapists in the system, and roughly 150,000 new patients or new episodes, I should say, per year within the system. Most of, uh, of the work we're doing is uh, orthopedic care types, so these are all outpatient uh, clinics. Uh, you've, uh, you're all familiar with, uh, with the terms of uh, participation and completion rates. Uh, these are the rates that, that we have uh, in Maccabi. You might have slightly different numbers uh, in your handout. These are the updated numbers. Uh, you can also see that 30% of the patients, roughly 30% of the patients, do not reach the end of the episode in an orderly fashion. So they just stop coming in. We don't always know why. Uh, usually we don't. We can, we can assume, but we don't really know. So this is a big issue of itself. This is a lot of patients. And uh, it's pretty much the, the, the numbers are very similar between clinics. And they have been very stable for a very long time. We've been measuring this for over 10 years now. Uh, so, so this is also a topic that would probably need to be addressed at, at a certain point. Uh, there's a website of Maccabi. You can look it up. Okay, so uh, I'm going to review key features of, uh, of PBE and discuss a little bit about steps uh, required to implement PBE. I'm going to give a few examples of our experience in Maccabi and, uh, and, and describe how we can use PBE to discover uh, associations uh, with best outcomes, between treatments and best outcomes. There are a lot of lessons that we learned. There's probably a lot we can learn from you as well. <coughs> and uh, hopefully some of you will be interested in, in going through this path, uh, which is uh, an amazing endeavor. And, uh, and I hope you'll, you'll get the feeling of this uh, throughout this presentation. And I, a wonderful thing is when you have a lot of data and it's very different from one another when there's a lot of variance. If there's a lot of variance, we can learn more from the data. So if we get data in not only from one system, even although it also has some variance in it, but we get some cooperation and we get international cooperation, data coming in uh, from very different systems, 
uh, the assumption is that we can learn more from it. So I hope some of you will be interesting, interested in that. You're all familiar with the uh, term evidence-based practice, but we're discussing a, a slightly different term, and the term is practice-based evidence. Uh, the idea here is that uh, the evidence is derived from routine practice, from day-to-day -day practice. The person who came up with this term is uh, Professor uh, Susan Horn. Uh, we've done a lot of work with her, and uh, Dennis was one of my PhD supervisors. Uh, Susan was the second one. Uh, she came up with this idea a long time ago. It was called um, clinical practice improvement at the beginning, then she came up with this term. So she's also giving a course. If some of you want to learn from her, you can. She's, uh, she's giving these courses, two-day courses on PBE. Uh, it's more of a workshop than just a course. We've published uh, last year a paper uh, that describes uh, differences, uh, advantages, disadvantages of different uh, methodologies uh, of research design. So we basically looked at practice-based evidence uh, and compared that to randomized controlled trials and more uh, traditional observational studies. So if you want to look it up, you can. Uh, and this will, some of the presentation is based on, on this work. So let's discuss a little bit about some key features of, uh, of PBE. First of all, uh, this is, we like to think of it as a very comprehensive uh, and prospective <coughs> observational study. So, and, and the, the reason why we uh, want it to be very comprehensive in terms of the data that, that we can get in, the descriptions of the patients, the dealing with all of the different confounders as many of you mentioned before, and Linda just discussed this, uh, is obviously to be able to control for them. And this has to help us, we hope it will help us, uh, <coughs> to decrease the bias that is generally associated with uh, more uh, traditional observational studies. Traditional observational studies were usually based on existing databases, databases that were not constructed for research purposes. Uh, they could come from, from claim databases, from insurance companies. This is a different story. Here we start by, by defining and constructing the database so it can help us learn about associations between treatment and outcome. <coughs> the evidence is derived from routine practice, from what you guys are doing. Uh, this is a, a, a very important feature. We're not influencing in those designs what you're doing. We're just collecting it. So there's no experiment going on. Uh, there is really an exhaustive uh, attention given to patient characteristics. We'll discuss this a little bit later on. And usually we're using very large uh, databases. Now what Susan always says is that this uh, we were able to do these kinds of studies because of computers. We have uh, computers that 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have the ability to have such large databases on, on just very small computers that are available to everyone. So we can collect data directly using computerized uh, methods and, and it's fairly easy today uh, to get those very large databases. <laughs> We'll talk about, about the inclusion of frontline clinicians. Uh, this is a very important topic because researchers tend to get away a little bit from what happens in real life. Right? And you know the old saying, if you can treat, treat. If you can't treat, well, try managing. If you can't, <laughs> if you can't manage, maybe try teaching. If you can't do either of these, do research. So, <laughs> so when we get into that, that aspect of research, we're kind of, you know, a little bit far away from what happens. And we need, we need the clinicians for these kind of studies. Not only these studies, this is true for many studies. But we need the information from the clinicians in order to know what variables are important to capture. So this is a, a, an important uh, key feature. <coughs> and we'll talk also about uh, standard, standardized documentation 
uh, of, uh, of interventions. This is a big project we've been involved in. Uh, we don't know yet how much of the variants could be explained by, the, by interventions, maybe very little, even after we define them and we all use them the same way. Uh, maybe you will be surprised and uh, happily surprised and see that we can explain uh, a good amount of variants uh, just looking at what we're doing at the treatment. But before doing this, we have to define those treatments. We have to test for reliability. We have to use the same, the same treatment codes in the same manner uh, between clinics, between therapists, clinics, systems, etc. Okay, so <coughs> the basic questions that we need to address are obviously uh, are treatments associated with uh, <coughs> uh, with with the intended outcomes, and we want to identify subsets of patients. Uh, for which these interventions work best. Obviously, we all have limited clinical resources, and uh, so there, therefore we need to be efficient. Everybody discussed, about, discussed this issue during this, this meeting, so there's not much to say about this in addition. Okay, so the first step. Let's talk about some steps in getting into PBE uh, design. The first one is to create a, a, a project clinical team. It's not just a research team. It has to be a clinical team. When we've done that, uh, we'll define the measures that we want to use, uh, measures of patient severity, and we can use many different measures. Uh, clinicians need to come up and say to us, listen, we think this influences outcome. This describes the severity of a patient. It's amazing to see how much important and valid information come from clinicians. They see that on, on, you see that on a daily basis. And then we have to start uh, collecting the data. Once we collect the data, we need to check for the reliability of this data, and therefore we create a database. And I'll describe briefly the database that we've created, and, and maybe some of you have as well. Now once we have the database, we can start testing different hypotheses of these associations. We can bring up uh, ideas of what we think, uh, what kind of treatments we think are associated with, with the intended outcomes. And then we have to validate the study findings. And there are many different ways of validating the study findings, but the best one is to implement what we found. If we found that a specific treatment is associated, if we do more of that treatment, that's associated with better outcomes, then let's do more of it. And after we do more of it, we go back to the database and we retest the data, and then we want to see if the outcomes actually improve or not. So this is a very good way to validate our findings. And if we have validated our findings, then we just incorporate these findings into standard uh, practice of care. So this is a fairly long process. It's not something that's done in, in a few weeks. It can take years. Uh, but this is what we've been doing in a pretty large system with a lot of therapists, and we haven't, we haven't gotten to those two bullet points at the end yet, but hopefully uh, we will. So uh, a few examples. This is a paper we published in 2008 uh, describing the implementation process uh, uh, and the integration process of the electronic uh, outcomes measurement system and the electronic health record. So you can look it up. Uh, the, the whole process that we went through is described in this paper. Uh, and I know some of you are already doing this, and a lot of you want to uh, be able to use. I, I was surprised yesterday to see that many of you, actually most of you, already use electronic health record. Uh, I think this wasn't the case uh, four or five years ago, was it? So this is a big change. Uh, and this, this could be the next step, the merging of the, uh, of the EMRs with the, uh, ele with the electronic outcome system. And then you can go towards uh, creating your own database. So, uh, so this is how the database looks like. This is uh, basically three cornerstones. Uh, the patient characteristic, the treatment process, and the outcomes. So 
so? OK. So what we're trying to do, I'll stay closer to this, uh, is control for patient characteristics in order to identify the treatment process that are uh, associated with the best outcome. Looking at, at this in a little bit more detail, uh, maybe let's go through this and see what, how the database is constructed. So the, uh, the basic part is the electronic health records. And uh, is there a pointer here? The center? Okay, good. So, so we start from this. We start from the electronic health record. And from there we can, uh, we can collect patient data. Uh, the patient data will include demographic data and health data. And we'll describe this in, in, a, few, in a few moments. Then from the electronic health record, we can also have the process data. We can have administrative uh, process data, for instance, number of visits, different administrative uh, variables, and we can actually look at the specific uh, treatments or interventions that we're using. Uh, we're using the photo system, as you are, uh, so uh, this is the source of our uh, outcomes data, although we can also define some additional outcomes. And we are also using additional databases. Since we're working in a system that's a full scope healthcare system, uh, we also have databases that do not originate from physical therapy practice. For instance, uh, data on comorbidity. We have all of the diagnoses that all of the patients received from any doctor they visited within the system. And we can also separate acute diagnosis from chronic conditions. Uh, there are also registries that were, uh, that were constructed within Maccabi. For example, a uh, diabetes registry. So in order for a patient to be related to a specific registry, uh, there are several criteria that have to be met in terms of uh, uh, ICD-9 codes, medication use, etc. So we can also use that to describe uh, what the patient comes in with when he comes uh, when they come into the clinic. We, we also have data on chronic medication usage. So we don't only have data on prescriptions, but we actually know what has been purchased in the pharmaceutical uh, arena. Uh, we don't know if the patient took the medicine or not. So that's, that's something we can't, we can't know at the moment. They probably will never be able to know. But if they purchase it, so yeah, it's, it's the closest thing we can get to, to actually usage of, of, of uh, medication. <coughs> and there's also another computerized uh, system which deals with appointment scheduling. Uh, from there, we can know the, uh, the timing of the visit. We can calculate uh, waiting periods uh, between uh, the time of the initial appointment and the actual evaluation, the waiting period to get into physical therapy. We can also calculate the waiting period from the time of the uh, referral, from the date of the referral to physical therapy to the entry. And these variables seem to be very important. Usually these variables are significant within our model. The longer uh, the waiting period, uh, the worse the outcomes are. And I think that has been published in other uh, papers as well. Yeah, came to life again. <laughs> uh, well, maybe I'll stay here. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, we'll go through this quickly, uh, examples of demographic kind of data that we can collect. Uh, we also use, uh, we collect language, the language that was used to, uh, yep, okay, sorry. Uh, you'll see that we've translated the, uh, the outcome system into uh, different languages so we can know which language was used. It tells us something about the background of the patients. And uh, there's a large scope of, uh, of patient uh, health data. I don't think we need to go over these. Uh, you know you're all collecting most of these. Uh, maybe just a, a word on, on physical therapist classifications. Uh, we are collecting classifications. Obviously that, that's defined uh, depending on uh, what kind of education the therapist received. Uh, but we're not only looking at ICD-9 codes. We, we put a lot of emphasis on the classification issue, uh, which has been discussed extensively yesterday. And uh, <coughs> uh, 
Uh, these are examples of comorbidities. I guess there's nothing new here for you guys. Chronic use of medication for many different conditions. So again, going back to what we said before, this is a, a way we're trying to have a very comprehensive description of who the patient is. So we can control for all of these issues that we usually cannot influence when we're looking at the associations between our treatments and outcomes. This is uh, some administrative uh, process data, uh, maybe just a few words on the attendance and exercise compliance. We're trying to collect data on compliance of our patients uh, in therapy. At this time, the, the data is collected by the therapist at discharge. Uh, we hope to be able to implement exercise logs, uh, which are uh, probably more valid than just the therapist description at, at the end, whether the patient was compliant or not. <coughs> and uh, talked about the referral, uh, the physicians that refer our patients. We want to know who they are. This was uh, discussed uh, by Linda before. Uh, there is no, uh, at the moment, there is no direct access in Maccabi. Uh, although it's permitted. We hope going into that direction, but all of our patients are referred by doctors. So we do go back and look at who the doctors were, and we put that in these regressions, and we found very similar results. Uh, patients that are uh, admitted, that were referred by general practitioners, uh, usually have better outcomes than those that were, were referred by orthopedic surgeons. We don't know the reason for that. And obviously, you have to remember that this is after controlling for severity. So there's something going on there. We don't know exactly what it is. Therapist data, uh, clinic level data, and just a few words on the treatment uh, coding. We're, uh, we have adopted uh, what was published in, uh, in, in the physical therapy, uh, in the guide to physical therapy in 2001 and the way they uh, divided the treatment into, into groups. And we're using these six groups, uh, a work that has been, actually uh, Mark started this work over here with the MDT group, defining many different treatment codes. <coughs> uh, we elaborated on that and added not only treatment codes for uh, low back pain, but for all of the scope of physical therapy. We ended up having 200 codes, about 200 codes, and we're actually studying now the reliability between therapists in using these codes. Uh, so I hope we'll be advancing with these studies as well. And once we do that, uh, just think of a situation where you know, we're, we're all using the same codes after having testing them for reliability. Uh, hopefully, as I said before, this will help us identify more associations between treatments and outcomes. Treatment duration is an important issue as well. Uh, we, uh, we are collecting time, not only of the visits, but also time uh, that the patients uh, spend in the clinic. They could come for a 30-minute appointment but stay in the clinic for an hour and a half. Maybe that's important to measure. Maybe we have to analyze that. So we are collecting this data. Uh, we have not yet analyzed the time that they spend at the clinic data. Uh, but we have found in other studies, studies uh, conducted by, by Susan Horn on patients after stroke, we have found that the time issue, not just the number of visits, but how many minutes, and we also investigated their intensity, so minutes per week. That, that also seems to be an important way to look at, at the time issue, looking at the intensity. And we found many times that intensity predicts more of the variance in outcomes than, than just the uh, overall time. That could be true maybe for, for patients post-stroke and not for the other patients. We don't know yet, but it's something we need to look into. <coughs> I discussed the appointment scheduling uh, database and many different outcomes can be used. Uh, obviously, functional status, risk-adjusted functional status, uh, recurrences of episodes. We do measure how many times patients come in again into the system in, in a period of time. For instance, in a year. If they come again for the same kind of problem from the same impairment, we look at it as not being a very good outcome. Uh, maybe that means uh, they were not independent enough in the way they can keep on treating their own problem. Maybe we didn't give them enough tools. 
So this is another issue that we're going to be looking at. Uh, goal attainment, uh, as described by the therapist, is not a very strong outcome measure, but we have that in the database. Ability to return to full activity, also uh, as described by the therapist at this charge, again, not a very strong outcome measure. Uh, medication usage uh, during the episode of care. And the follow-up issue. The follow-up is issue uh, is, is important. We are going to be switching to the web version. We were still on the LAN version uh, because our system is slightly different than yours. Uh, but once we do, and hopefully this will happen very soon, we'll be able to post those uh, surveys uh, on the web through a, uh, through a system that Maccabi already has, which is protected by a password. It's, a, it's an online system. Patients can log on to that system to get their uh, blood test results, to make appointments to doctors. They can do many things within that system. So we can use the same system and, uh, and make a uh, photo available on that system. Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to see what happens with the patients three months post-discharge, six months, a year. We'll see how that goes. We have automatic systems that, it, they can, uh, that can send uh, text messages, emails, so used as, also used as uh, reminders for the appointments, but they can also be used maybe for, uh, for asking patients to, to get us some follow-up data. The cost issue is, uh, is very wide. We're just starting to look at that. Uh, we, can, we can actually know what happens with a patient in all of the other services that we have, not only physical therapy. So we can look at overall costs, uh, there's a big study that has been initiated and we're just starting to analyze this data, uh, looking at, at patients with low back pain, uh, seeing what happens from the moment they were diagnosed at the doctor's office. So, and then we can follow up on what happens to them. Not all of them go into physical therapy. And those that are referred to physical therapy, we discovered that about a half of them never come in. So what happens with them? Where do they go? What kind of costs are related to these patients? Unfortunately, we don't have the outcomes for these patients because we're, at the moment, the only ones using the outcome system. Hopefully, the, uh, uh, the doctors will, <coughs> will join us, uh, orthopedic surgeons, uh, general practitioners. Uh, if more people in the system would use the, um, the photo measures, then obviously we could learn a lot more. This is the, uh, the screen, uh, the entry screen of, of PI as it is now in Israel, slightly different than what you know. We're using uh, touch screen stands, so pe people come, uh, patients come onto those stands and they just use a touch screen. They start by selecting the language uh, that they prefer. So as you can see, it was translated to uh, Russian, to Arabic. Uh, just uh, mentioning some of our past experience uh, with implementation. Uh, we introduced the term of participation rate in that 2008 paper. Uh, the goal was uh, a 90% goal. And remember, we can know exactly what the participation rate is because all of our patients come onto the electronic <coughs> health record. I understand this is a challenge for some of you uh, to know what we start from. Who are all of the patients that come through the door? We know that, and then we can know how much of these went on to uh, taking in an intake survey. Uh, this is a pilot phase that was conducted in 2005 when we just started uh, the implementation process. So these are months throughout that year, and you can see the improvement. This is only for 11 clinics we had back then using the system. Uh, and we implemented the system in the other clinics later on. Uh, 2007, this, uh, the uh, participation rate went up to 86%, and we're currently at about 93%. And we've been there for a while, so it seems to be a kind of a limit. We, we don't seem to be able to uh, go over that limit. There's always some patients, and I'm talking only about the patients that are eligible to use the system. So these are... Uh, uh, basically adult patients with orthopedic impairments. So this is where we are, and we're pretty happy with that. Completion rate is a whole other story. As it was mentioned yesterday, uh, much more difficult to achieve a very high completion rate. This is again that pilot with the 11 clinics during 2005. 
The goal was 65%. Uh, why 65 and not above that? Uh, as you remember, I was saying before, we have a lot of patients never reaching the end of the episode. And, uh, but we've actually never reached that 65% on a national average. Oh, and here again. Okay. He's telling you, you're not telling anything. <laughs> Uh, we don't know uh, if we can. There are several clinics that uh, uh, went even above the 65% uh, completion rate. That's when they don't have as many dropouts as the other clinics. But uh, uh, this seems to be, uh, we seem to be stabilizing on this 57, 58%. Now keep in mind another thing. When somebody talks about completion rate, ask what their definition of completion rate is. There are different definitions that are used. Uh, the one that we used over here uh, on this slide from that 2005 um, uh, <coughs> pilot stage was the complete episodes from all of the episode, all of the patients that went into the clinic, not only those that took an intake. Uh, the completion rate that most of you are using, that photo is using, is the number of patients that have complete episodes from those that have an intake. So this gives us slightly different numbers. And again, there you have to drill in and see what the exact definition is because the completion rate we use in Maccabi, we want that discharge survey to be uh, completed on the exact date of the last uh, uh, treatment date. Uh, I think photo uses the last, just the last survey in the, uh, throughout the episode. Okay, so this is again a slightly different uh, definition. So you just have to be aware that there are different definitions of completion rate. <coughs> and here are some of our conclusions. We found uh, that the routine collection of functional status outcomes in a very large uh, system uh, is realistic. Uh, obviously, CAT uh, is needed. We, ha we would have never gone into this or whole uh, outcomes measurement issue with, without the computerized adaptive testing. Uh, when I first met Dennis back in 2000, Photo didn't use uh, computerized adaptive testing yet. Yet uh, We heard about John Ware, I think in quality metrics, started to do something on, on cats uh, using the SF36. And, uh, and, and that's when uh, Photo started going that way. And we understood right away that we were not even going to start using paper-based outcomes because of clinic burden, patient burden, efficiency issues, et cetera. Okay, so we could reach the 90% participation rate. Completion rate is much more difficult. And there's a lot of, of involvement that has to, be, uh, <coughs> has, has to be made by managers. If a clinic manager does not want to go that way, the clinic will not go that way, regardless of the system behind it. So there's a lot of education. Uh, that had to be made with clinic managers. Uh, and, and, and if we were not successful with that, uh, we were not successful with the implementation. I, I mentioned before the possibility of linking outcomes collection process and payment. We decided to leave this aside at the moment for the reasons I described before. Uh, Linda described, uh, talked about the need to uh, test validity of our outcome measures. We've done a few studies on this, uh, looking at uh, how the measurement tools actually work here in the States compared to how they work in Israel. Uh, and, uh, and then we also compare different population within the Israeli population. It's a very diverse population, a lot of immigration, people coming in from all over, as you saw many different languages, it's not obvious that the items used on the photo bank is uh, on the item bank uh, are perceived the same way by all of these patients. So this has to be looked into. We did that for the NECAT and obviously we need to do that. And we found, by the way, the findings were that uh, there was no what we call differential item functioning, no practical differential item functioning. Meaning uh, the populations, the different populations that we tested, uh, English-speaking people in the U.S. versus Hebrew in Israel and Hebrew versus Russian in Israel, uh, they all perceived the items in the exact same way, the same difficulty uh, level. So we didn't need to adjust. But if we do find diff, we can always adjust for that. Okay, just to remind you, this is what we're trying to do. 
Uh, maybe I'm going to skip over these, uh, these issues that relate to PBE. We discussed a few of them, large samples. Uh, just a word about the exclusion criteria. One of the problems we, ha we have with experimental studies, there are many, many exclusion criteria. Sometimes we end up analyzing a very small portion of the real population that comes into our clinic. And this was published, sometimes it's around 15% of the true population, because that's the way we can eliminate confounders in experimental studies. Here we try to use minimal exclusion criteria uh, so we can have a very good description of the true population that we're treating. <coughs> Not going to talk about statistical issues here. Linda mentioned some before. Uh, no need for consent forms in these kind of studies. This is an important issue to know. Uh, since we're not modifying treatment, we do need to go through an ILB process, but we don't need to have patients sign consent forms, which is an advantage, of course. And the limitation that PBE has, one of the limitations that it has, that we cannot really prove causality. We're just looking at associations. We cannot be sure, you know, what's the cause and effect uh, relationship in there. So this is something we all need to keep in mind. Obviously, if we assume causality and we validate our findings as we did before, we can get a little bit closer uh, to, to uh, assigning causality uh, compared to what we can just at the beginning when we just find associations. Again, the highly collaborative uh, process of the PBE process, and if you read the PBE papers, you'll see how involved the, the frontline clinicians are. This is the part I like best about PBE, is the work with the frontline clinicians, the, idea that come, the ideas that come up. Uh, that's a fascinating process. This is an example of a paper we published in 2009 looking at different associations between uh, uh, the treatments that we were doing in Maccabi and outcomes controlling for patient characteristics. Uh, just a quick uh, example. How much time do I have left? Okay. Uh, these are some of the results that we find in the paper. I don't think you're seeing anything, but I'll point out uh, a couple of things in here. We studied uh, different models for different impairment categories, uh, lumbar patients, knee patients, uh, uh, we looked at cervical and shoulder impairments, and, and as you can see, we had over 20,000 patients uh, within this study, <coughs> and we found uh, different associations. So looking at patient characteristics, I could just give you an example. Let's focus on patients with lumbar impairments. Uh, we found, uh, uh, for example, a negative association between a chronic use of antidepressant medication and outcomes. So they seem to be something that's important to control for. What was interesting is that we found that across the board. That was true for all of the impairment categories we looked at, with the coefficients being very similar between these uh, impairments. Uh, some examples about associations we found between treatment processes and outcomes. Again, looking at lumbar, uh, we found that the compliance, the exercise compliance of patients are uh, very predictive of the outcome. And actually, it was, the, it was the strongest predictor from all of the treatment processes we looked at. So basically, what that meant is that, and I guess you all know that, but it's nice to see that in the data, if we uh, are able to convince our patients do what they need to do, uh, their chance of having good outcomes is uh, largely improved. Uh, so we, we've put a lot of focus on this issue since we, we found uh, these associations. We also found an interesting association between uh, the number of surveys uh, that were completed throughout the episode of care. Mark, I think you mentioned that yesterday. Uh, that was kind of nice to see that when uh, therapists uh, decided uh, to have more than just the intake and discharge survey. If they had three or more surveys, uh, their patients would get better outcomes. So what's exactly behind that, we don't know. We don't know what the cause and effect is. We found the association. We can assume different cause and effect uh, relationships, maybe uh, influence on clinical reasoning, uh, whatever happens in, in the therapist's head when he sees the data. Maybe it's a sign of actually using the data 
we know that many people are just you know, sending the patients to completely have good completion rate, but not all of the therapists are actually using the form. Some of them are not even looking at it. So there's a large educational issue. Maybe this describes part of it, but this is just an assumption. This is not a proof for, for a cause and effect relationship. We found electrotherapeutic uh, modalities used for pain management usually being negatively associated with outcomes. So the more we did of that, the worse the outcomes were after controlling for all of the other variables. Uh, on the other hand, exercise, stabilizing exercises for patients with lumbar impairments were found to be positively associated with outcomes. Looking at ultrasound, for, for example, ultrasound is used mainly for patients with shoulder impairments, very frequent <coughs> use of ultrasound. And ultrasound was found to be negatively associated with outcomes, although the use is very frequent. So when we feedback this information back to the therapist, uh, it did change their behavior. And we saw with time, not immediately, it took time, uh, very difficult for us to really change an old habit. Uh, but we can. And if we look at data of change of behavior, behaviors of therapists looking at treatment selection, uh, we do see a difference. Now we have to validate this finding by relooking at the data, see if actually, compared to this data, if we're doing less ultrasound, more of the other stuff, are the outcomes actually improving or not? This would be the, the next step to validate this finding. <coughs> okay, so uh, a lot of more things we need to do. Uh, the integration, this integration of the electronic health record with the outcomes data is very valuable. We've been using it for a long time, and there's a lot more to improve in terms of standardization of uh, data coding, uh, patient classifications. Uh, we need to add more measures. We have added fear avoidance throughout the years. Uh, we're going to add with the next version the use of, uh, of the uh, depression and, and somatization scores. Uh, we're also using pain. I didn't mention pain before, but this is used as well. Uh, um, talking about alliance issues now, uh, this is a, a, a hot and warm discussion now to see if we can actually measure uh, the uh, patient-therapist alliance. We think there is a lot in there, just you know, from a gut feeling, and there are a few recent publications that just came out about the use of, of working alliance. I don't know if anybody here has some experience actually using it in, uh, in routine care. Uh, does anybody have experience using that? Well, I'm not surprised because we also asked all of the authors that published these last papers whether uh, they know of uh, routine use and they don't. Uh, from what we know, it was used only for research purposes up to now. So when you do that, when you use this inventory for research purposes, the therapist does not see He's blind. The therapists are blinded to the answers. Uh, if you've seen these questions, some, some of them are kind of intimate. There is a bond uh, aspect within that inventory. You know, um, <coughs> how much do I think my therapist likes me? Things like that. So we don't know how the patients are actually going to respond when this data is given to the therapist that's treating them. Uh, but we do think the inventory, the, the patient, uh, uh, therapist alliance inventory is important to look at and to see if we can make use of that or not. So a lot to do. And again, this feedback loop. The basic idea is once we collect, we work with the therapists in order to decide which data to collect. Then we collect it, we analyze it, we feedback that back to the therapist and we create a continuous loop, hopefully seeing the outcomes improve. And we have seen the outcomes in Maccabi continuously improving throughout the years. Not a lot, not as much as we would like them to improve, but there is an improvement with time. Uh, just some examples of ongoing uh, PB projects uh, in Maccabi. We're studying associations between uh, MDT education and outcomes. Uh, and we're looking at outcomes within different stages of, of education. And actually, Linda and, and, and Julie and Mark are helping a lot with this process. <coughs> Setup manager, where did this come from? <laughs> oh, it's gone. 
Uh, there is a project that was initiated by a few therapists wanting to do a PBE study on trigger points. We don't have a lot of patients with trigger points. About 2% of our physical therapy database uh, relates to patients with trigger points, but this is what they wanted to look at. So they initiated a multi-center PBE process uh, in order to be able to look at this data. We haven't analyzed the data yet, but it's, it's becoming available. Uh, looking at lymphatic therapy, uh, uh, also a PBE project that is just starting now, and uh, uh, different issues related to uh, patients with cervical impairments after a motor vehicle accident, another uh, PBE project that has been initiated to look at that. Uh, and I mentioned before uh, the project that we want to look at overall healthcare costs. So this would be a kind of a PBE project, but not looking only at physical therapy, but looking at what's happening in the full scope of the system. Uh, I, I already said a few words about the need for, for personal tutoring. So the therapists first know how to use the data from a clinical perspective. Many of you have discussed, it has been discussed yesterday. This is a crucial issue. We're investing a lot of efforts into this. And, uh, <clears throat> and you saw a few, uh, a few projects that have started. And again, I'd like to call for uh, cooperation uh, between many different therapists all over the world. Uh, we, can, we can work remotely. We do a lot of work remotely uh, with people. We work with people here. Databases can be easily shared today. Uh, we have to talk about the definitions. We have to be able to collect similar kinds of data uh, in order to be uh, able to conduct competitive effectiveness research projects. This is a big goal. Uh, we haven't really gone there yet. We looked at different comparisons within our system, but not yet between systems. And the hope is that we'll discover a lot of interesting findings there. So thank you first for the invitation, for your attention. There is a very long list of people here that need to be acknowledged. Uh, first starting by, by Dennis and, and Susan Horn, then all of the others uh, have been co-authors on, on the uh, publications. Uh, Maccabi physical therapists, the clinic managers have a huge role in all of this. You cannot do any of this if they're not really devoted to the process. Uh, same thing for the, we have, we have five districts throughout the country. Th same thing goes for the uh, district managers. Uh, we also have research coordinators and uh, the IT department working very closely to the photo team. Uh, uh, which uh, was really wonderful with a lot of challenges. It's not easy, was not easy for the, for the photo people to be able to merge uh, uh, the, the outcome system within the Maccabi system without actually being there. Most of the work being done remotely, except for one visit. Uh, ben and Jerry came once, we had a lot of good wine, and uh, uh, that was fun. Uh, but most of the work uh, is being done remotely. That's not, a, not, not an easy uh, thing to achieve. So thank you a lot, Photo, for all of the team, which has grown tremendously since the first time I came, 2004. I think you were four or five people, something like that. Right, Julie? Okay, so uh, thank you very much if you have questions.